Hey everybody, I want to take a couple minutes to introduce you to some eukaryotic pathogens. We're all familiar with eukaryotes in terms of humans, uh, plants, animals, right? But it turns out that some pathogens that infect us are eukaryotic. <clears throat> so the first way I want you thinking about this is from a phylogenetic standpoint. In other words, if we look at the DNA of living things, what things are similar to each other and what things are different? If we try to group living things based on their DNA, what we find is that there are three domains, three major clusters of DNA types. We find one major cluster that we call the bacteria. This is the domain bacteria. We find a second one that's very similar to the bacteria. And we, years ago, before DNA technology, used to think that they were kind of lumped together. Uh, they're called the archaea. We now know that they're a complete separate branch on the tree of life. Both the bacteria and the archaea have a prokaryotic cell structure. Make sure you know what that word means. We will talk more about it in class coming up. Now, all the big stuff on planet Earth, the people, the plants, uh, the bunnies, all fall into the domain eukarya, and they all have a eukaryotic cell structure. Uh, and we'll look at what that means in just a minute. So you and I and bunnies are here on a branch of the eukarya, but then there are also some single-celled eukaryotes like uh, giardia, like uh, yeasts, and we're going to talk about some of those because some of those can actually cause infections in humans. <clears throat> you should take the time to review what you've learned in the past, probably in your A and P class, about the eukaryotic cell and how that eukaryotic cell is structured. Uh, the key difference between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell is that eukaryotes are highly compartmentalized. They have membrane-bound organelles, things like a nucleus and an endoplasmic reticulum and a Golgi apparatus and vesicles and so on, in order to compartmentalize their various functions. Uh, the prokaryotes, and for our purposes in infectious diseases, we're thinking the bacteria, because as far as we know, archaea don't cause infections. They might, we just haven't discovered any yet. Uh, the bacteria are much simpler in their structure. There's no nucleus. There are uh, very few membrane-bound organelles and certainly nothing like the extent that we see in the eukaryotes. So review this, this content. Make sure you recognize in diagrams and even in images different structures. Um, and then make sure you also understand, not just memorize, but understand the various functions. Uh, this should be review for you, but it's important review. The other thing that I want to point out is that um, the DNA, the genome in eukaryotes is often quite different from that of prokaryotes. Whereas prokaryotes typically only have a single chromosome, eukaryotes usually have multiple chromosomes. Eukaryotic chromosomes are usually linear. You just have a first nucleotide and a last or base pair and a last base pair in the chromosome. Whereas prokaryotic chromosomes are usually looped back around on themselves into a ring and so they're circular chromosomes. Many eukaryotes are diploid like you and I are, meaning that they've got chromosome number one from mom, but also another copy of chromosome one from dad with slightly different versions of all the genes that are on them. Prokaryotes are all haploid where they only have one copy of every gene and therefore they get one shot at getting it right. And then there are those uh, compartments, those membrane bound organelles that we talked about, like the nucleus, mitochondria, chloroplasts. And interestingly, the nucleus is where the bulk of the DNA is found, not surprisingly, but mitochondria and chloroplasts also have some DNA of their own. And they also, uh, they, they divide independently of the process of mitosis or meiosis in the host cell. And they divide by essentially binary fission, just like the prokaryotes do. It's a really interesting phenomenon. How big are the genomes? Well, this, one of the smaller eukaryotic genomes would be yeast. And that's around 12 million base pairs. Well, makes up about 6,000 genes on 16 separate chromosomes. You can compare that to the human genome at about 3 billion base pairs, so much larger, uh, 23 to 25,000 genes and 46 chromosomes. We will talk next week about uh, the prokaryotes and prokaryotic genomes, and when we do, you'll see that, that the bacterial genome, like E. coli, is only a few million base pairs, so much smaller even than the smallest eukaryotic genome that we know of. <clears throat> All right.
So what kinds of eukaryotic pathogens are there? It says eukaryotic microbes. It really should say eukaryotic pathogens. What are the three types of, of uh, microscopic eukaryotes that can cause infections in humans? Primarily, we're talking about fungi, which we're going to see are the molds and the yeasts. Protozoa, like this Giardia cell here, uh, which is a single-celled organism. Uh, and then helminths, which is a fancy word for small worms, although they're not always small, they can get pretty large. So here's a, a liver fluke being removed from a patient's liver. Uh, the helminths are included in the eukaryotic microbes because their egg stage and larval stages are typically microscopic or close to it, and because they are often infectious. So when we think about, let me slide this picture up a little bit, when we think about the fungi, uh, there's a lot of different fungi out there. As far as infectious fungi go, yeast are the single-celled fungi. Okay, so you can think of brewer's yeast and baker's yeast. Uh, the, one of the more common infectious yeasts is called Candida albicans. It can cause vaginal yeast infections, uh, skin yeast infections called cutaneous candidiasis. Um, they can form thrush in the mouth. Sometimes they can overgrow the intestinal tract. These are single-celled uh, eukaryotes, and so they're going to have a nucleus just like any other eukaryote, and they're going to have mitochondria just like other eukaryotes, and so on. Now, when, you, when uh, fungi take on multicellular forms, the kind that can infect us are what we call molds. And uh, like aspergillus is a, is a good example. Molds have a stalk-like structure. They're very plant-like in a lot of ways. They have a stalk structure that we call hyphae, and these are multiple cells. This is multicellular uh, stalk. And then there's a head region that is all the reproductive structures, and we call these sporophores. Either conidiophores, which are loose and open, structures like you see on the right side here, or sporangiophores that have these closed spheres. But in either case, these sporophores have uh, the reproductive structures that can, in the wind, uh, be transmitted and dispersed just like, say, dandelions, and their seeds can be dispersed. Same idea. Where molds are most a threat to humans is in the lungs uh, with asthma and pneumonia. And the people that are typically, this is a broad generalization, people that are typically most susceptible to mold infections of the lungs are people with compromised immune systems. There are some that can infect perfectly healthy people, but they're not very common. Another category of, um, of mold infections would be tinea. Tinea refers to infections of the skin, hair, or nails. Three common species are epidermophyte and trichophyte and microsporum. We know these more commonly in our culture as athlete's foot or jock itch, depending on whether it's on the feet or in the jock area. Ringworm, if it's out uh, on the skin like hands, arms, etc. Or onychomycosis, if it's nails or hair and scalp. But these are all fungal infections as well. And remember, molds are multicellular infectious fungi. Not all molds are infectious. Um, and the yeasts are the single-celled fungi. Okay, so we've got our fungi. Second category were the protozoa. I'll give you three examples, trypanosoma, entamoeba, and plasmodium. You've got trypanosoma cruzi on the left, which causes Chagas disease, um, more common in, in uh, Central and South America than here in North America. There's a, an insect called the kissing bug or the triatamine bug that is involved in its transmission. Um, but you can see that it is a large motile eukaryote. In fact, the way we... Protozoa are tough to define, but the way we generally define protozoa is single-celled motile eukaryotes. Single-celled motile eukaryotes. The, that's typically the, uh, the, the sort of three-factor um, definition that we use for the protozoa. And many of these protozoa are, in fact, uh, infectious. In fact, if, if someone's infected with protozoa, we, we say that they have a... Um, we say that they have a parasitic infection. We use that term parasite for both protozoal infections as well as for uh, worm infections. And then Entamoeba histolytica is another common example. This moves by amoeboid movement, crawling, that, like we've seen before, can cause a form of uh, severe diarrhea called amoebic dysentery. And then on the right-hand side, we've got Plasmodium falciparum, which is one of the, the primary causes of malaria, also an insect vector interestingly, involved in transmitting that. So um, <clears throat> there are protozoa, single-celled motile eukaryotes that can infect humans. 
and cause some pretty significant disease. And then finally, the helminths. Uh, helminths are the three types of infectious worms. The roundworms, the tapeworms, and the flukes. The eggs and larvae are often microscopic, whereas the worms themselves, like these adult liver flukes, are usually visible to the naked eye. So these roundworm eggs are very, very tiny, microscopic only. These tapeworm larvae in feces, uh, I guess it depends on how closely you're looking at the feces, but they may be visible uh, to the naked eye. And then these uh, adult worms, in the case of liver flukes, are, are very clearly visible to the naked eye. Roundworms can start as such a tiny little egg and they can grow to huge, huge lengths like this uh, big Ascaris lumbricoides. I believe that's one worm there that was removed from one child, but they can be several feet long uh, as they're expelled from uh, from the abdomen of uh, an infected individual. So take home point here is that there are some really important eukaryotic pathogens. They're less common than bacteria, which are prokaryotic, or viruses, which are non-karyotic, right? They don't fit into that same scheme of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, they're not as common, at least not in North America. We tend to see a lot of these eukaryotic pathogens more commonly in, um, in the tropics, between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, uh, partly because of poverty, partly because of humidity and warm temperatures year round. So if you plan on on uh, either practicing healthcare any place other than the United States, or you plan on traveling yourself, or you just simply care about healthcare globally, uh, then understanding some of these eukaryotic pathogens, the parasites, and, and so we've got our, our fungi, but we've also got the two groups that we call parasites, the helminths and the protozoa, are very, very important in these other regions. So thanks for joining me on this. Uh, if you have questions, let me know. Shoot me an email and ask away. And uh, if this is something you want to follow up on on your own, I've got some great um, books that you could you could pick up um, and and learn a lot about these uh, these sort of neotropical, forgotten, neglected tropical diseases. Thanks.